Hey, you all. Carpetbagger here coming to you live from the west. More specifically, Montana. Now, we're entering Montana here momentarily. With this, I will have visited 47 of the continental United States. We're only missing Wyoming at this point. Now, Montana, known primarily for its natural beauty and very loud traffic. But, um, you know, this channel really isn't about natural beauty per se. So we're looking for something, something wacky, something interesting, a museum, an amusement park, a roadside attraction. You need to find something. So please follow me. Centered Yellowstone. So we have landed here in Bozeman, Montana, and I have found an attraction for us to feature. And what do you think of when you think of Montana? I know the first thing I think of is robots. We are at the American Computer and Robotic Museum here in Bozeman, Montana. So please follow me. Gutenberg Press, kind of the history of computers. See the old telephone switchboard back there. The history of tablets here, original Babylonian cuneiform brick. And uh, 4,000 years later, we get the uh, iPad. This is a replica of the world's oldest computer, the Antikythera mechanism. Bible leaf here is actually from 1230 AD. Here is the first computer sold to the general public, 1949, saying that this may be the last one of this model in existence. This is a Selectron from 1953, would hold 32 bytes of memory sold for $4,687. But today, you get a sand disk, holds 256 gigs, for about 40 bucks. This is the PDP-8, the world's first commercially successful desktop computer. Doesn't, doesn't really look like a computer, does it? It's a replica of a 1937 computer. You can see very, very primitive using pieces of an old beer can. And here is the birth of Silicon Valley. Computers were advanced in garages. You can see the computer programmer there with the long hair and mustache working on computers in his garage. Here is an original Apple One computer. It was given to the museum by Steve Wozniak. And you see he actually signed it right there. Steve Wozniak. Parentheses. Woz. It's the first handheld GPS device made in 1989. It's a big bulky thing. Imagine we pretty much are all carrying around a miniature superior version of that in our pockets right now. The first handheld and the first shirt pocket calculators. These are the original prototypes very important pieces in calculator history. Here's a hard disk from 1965. It is bigger than a trash can lid and it can record 27 
photographs or 2.5 minutes of video, you would need 125,000 of them to measure up to a modern hard drive. The original Apollo 15 moon watch, this watch was actually worn on the moon by Commander David Scott. You can see it's actually got a big band on it because I guess he'd have to wear it over his spacesuit. But yes, that watch there is done on the moon. The Apollo guidance computer. Little astronaut up there working on his computer. Oh wow, look at that. Wasn't expecting to see him in a computer museum. We have the Tyrannosaurus Rex. This microscope here, they have an actual ant brain. You can see the uh, view of the microscope there. Yeah, it's, a, it's an ant's brain. I guess the lesson here is that ants have large brains for their head, while the T Rex has a tiny brain. There's some other animal brains. That is a, a carp, a frog, a snake, a pigeon and a rabbit brain. All of them relatively tiny, at least in my opinion. And here's a DNA sequencer. All right, here we go. Here's the robots. Here's the laws of robotics. A robot may not injure a human being th or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders given by a human, unless it would conflict with the first law. So the first law is more important, I guess. A robot must protect its own existence as long as the protection does not conflict with the first or second law. I don't know. That the robots inevitably break these rules and kill us all. All right, here we go into the robot room. Here's a very, very cool old robot toy, and uh, I'm not sure what this fellow is here. Does anyone know which robot that is? Over here, I think we got some some pop culture robots. There's the Terminator, C-3PO, one of the creepy robots from iRobot. I think that's called a Borg, right? And that cardboard cutout of Star Wars buddies. And then here is Robbie the Robot from uh, Forbidden Planet, I believe. Some different varieties of toy robots down here. Oh, right there, there's the uh, little robotic Mickey Mouse. Wonder if he follows the three laws of robots. Oh, there's a little teddy bear from AI. Remember that movie, AI? That was a weird movie. Here's Ibo. And some friendly robotic dogs. And there's one of the more evil robots, Hal, from Space Odyssey. And, uh,. Yeah, I think he breaks the rule, the, the, the laws of robotics. I think he doesn't he doesn't he kill everyone or something. I've never seen the movie. I'm sorry. Now there's a really old school vacuum cleaner. I guess that technically is a robot, but this is definitely a robot. This is a Roomba. You know, my family we got a Roomba to help us keep the house clean, and it would basically sweep for about 30 seconds, and then it would get stuck under the couch. This is a Mitsubishi industrial robot arm. This is the this is the robot that, that, that puts people out of work, I guess, by doing human jobs with its grabbing arm. Talk about robots stealing jobs. Yeah, there's the robots building cars. There's a robot grilling burgers. There's a robot teddy bear lifting you out of bed. That's that one's kind of creepy, actually. Yeah, pizza robots. More burger robots. Oh no, is there anything robots can't do? Mr. Over here can play the violin. Is this some sort of grocery store watermelon robot? There's a World War II Enigma machine. This was a machine actually used by Nazis during the war to encode uh, 
messages. I admit some of this stuff is uh, is going a little bit over my head. Let's talk about Star Trek predicting the future. Apparently, 1966 they predicted the cell phone. 1987 they predicted the tablet. Ah, pretty good. 1988 I guess they predicted what is that? Zoom. I guess they have Zoom meetings. And 1998 they predicted Google Glass. Eh, that one's not that great. In this section we learn about the ultimate computer, the human brain. It's the world's first neural computer. Right there. So we have an actual human brain. Well, at least a slice of a human brain. But uh, yes, that used to be in someone's head, helping them think. And this computer right here is the last surviving computer used on the Apollo 11 moon mission. 32 kilobytes of RAM, only a thousand pounds. It talks about the first video games. This is, uh, I guess, was known as the Brown Box. It could play different primitive video games built in 1968. Looks like it even came with a rifle to use on some of the games. This is the Odyssey. I love like how complicated these were to hook up to your TV. These, all these little adapters and cords. And there's the classic Pong, 1975. I remember my grandma actually had a TV that had Pong built into it. You could flip a switch on the TV and it would immediately switch to Pong. Love to find a TV like that. And they have a Simon that is signed by the person that did the uh, the circuits for Simon. And down here we have some more modern style video games. This is a case that has one million computer transistors in it since this was previously on display at the uh, Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Back here we have a collection of different old-timey computers. This is the Osborne One. A Radio Shack brand computer, Commodore, a Newton, it's like a little handheld computer, it's the Apple Macintosh, Commodore 64. Oh, I like how it advertises the 20 megabytes right on the front there. It's funny, funny how far we've come. I guess, is that almost like a primitive laptop? It looks like that screen closes down. A collection of the first smartphones. Oh, here's the first portable CD player. I remember when those were a huge deal, and they were used to be very, very expensive. Here's the first uh, consumer digital camera in 1994. And the first MP3 player in 1998. Oh, this is the first iPad style or iPod style MP3 player in 1999. And that's a 1997 Nokia. A Simon. There's a phone known as a Simon. It's an Apple Newton. Mid 93. It's like a tablet. The AT&T EO 93. I like to fire those up and then see how they work. There's some big, clunky brick phones from the 80s. And that's a uh, Star Trek communicator. This giant video game here called Computer Space. It was a nice little museum, very informative, and had some pretty cool old computers. An absolute, obviously a, a, a passion project to have uh, such a collection of computers and computer parts. Must admit, I think this museum was probably meant for people a little smarter than me. <laughs> so I didn't totally understand everything I was seeing or reading. But still, if you love computers, 
in computer history. This is your this is your dream museum right here. Before we leave Bozeman, I wanted to stop and check out this statue here of Jim Bridger, who some feel was the ultimate mountain man. Now here in front of the Bozeman Chamber of Commerce, we have the statue of Jim Bridger. An artist was commissioned to make a statue of a mountain man to kind of embody the, the mountain spirit of the town and of the state of Montana. And the artist chose Jim Bridger, who he felt was the ultimate mountain man. Jim Bridger would, uh, would go on expeditions, uh, would take people to explore new areas of the country. He was familiar with the backwoods. He was familiar with the Native Americans. He could uh, negotiate between uh, white travelers and Native Americans. Spoke several different languages. Was known as being incredibly tough could live through harsh conditions and that is all true but unfortunately for Jim Bridger um, as, as far as pop culture goes he's probably best known for something else now for those of you who have seen the Leonardo DiCaprio movie The Revenant about Hugh Glass Hugh Glass one of the toughest Americans that ever lived had a bear rip all the skin off his back injure one of his legs injure one of his arms and uh, he did not die, and because uh, two men were left behind to take care of him, and uh, after almost a week, Hugh was still alive, but very, very near death. The two men decided it was best to leave Hugh Glass to, to die in peace. Unfortunately, Hugh Glass did not die. Hugh Glass um, crawled 200 miles through backwoods and snow and Indian attacks to confront the two men that left him to die. And one of those men was Jim Bridger. Now, we gotta, get, we gotta, we gotta be fair because Jim Bridger was only 17 years old when, uh, when that occurred. So he, he cannot take the full brunt of, of abandoning Hugh Glass. And apparently Hugh Glass confronted Jim Bridger face to face and Jim Bridger cried and cried and cried and apologized and Hugh Glass felt bad for the kid. He was crying, blubbering, and Hugh Glass was like, forget it. I'm not gonna kill you. But his life did not end there. He went on to become a notable mountain man himself so that after their paths diverted, they both became two of America's most famous and most hard scrabble mountain man. So thank you for joining me here today as we experience the beautiful state of Montana. But we can't stay here for long because we need to knock out the final state, the 48th, 48th state for me to have visited, that being Wyoming, which we're headed to very soon. So if you'd like to see other places I've been, check the interactive map in the description of this video. If you would like to uh, help support the channel, check out the description of this video. Uh, the Etsy shop, we're now selling two separate types of enamel pins. As always, we have Patreon, $3 or more. We'll get you a postcard once a month. But until next time, this one is in the bag.